I'm not offended if they're still working emails. I get it fired up. We're all privileged enough to be here. But work still needs to go on. Okay. Um, we're going to get started. Um, it's officially 10.45. Um, this talk for those that... It's too, the screen's too far away, is called Estimates, Expectations, and Evolution. My name is Rick Manelius. Uh, I'm currently the uh, Chief Product Officer at DRUD. Um, again, as I told the people that got here early, first of all, thank you for coming early, um, that I've spent a lot of years as a sports coach, track coach, um, mentor, um, and I've actually started and run the training programs um, at the agencies that I've worked at. And I really have studied how people learn and how to learn and how to get the best and most outcome to their time investment. You all are spending an hour of your time with me. And I can't thank you enough. It, it really, um, it means a lot to me. And since you're investing time in me, I gotta make sure that I'm delivering as much value as I can to you. So I've tried to condense a topic that I've worked on for probably over a decade uh, in the Drupal space. And I'm gonna try to distill as much as I can in an hour and I really hope to deliver on that. But if this is just information that you absorb but without actually apply it in your day to day, it's, it's information just like, uh, it'll just empty out of your RAM over time. So I don't necessarily recommend you take on the totality of what I go over, but I do recommend that you f uh, find ways to be thinking about during this presentation, what specific actionable step could I take in a problem that I'm facing right now and then apply it and that one nugget will be worth this entire talk. And I actually have people who've come back from previous versions of this uh, presentation, earlier versions, that said, you know, I didn't maybe understand all the pieces, but those two things really transformed my business and transformed how we work together. And the second is, I, I really recommend that you, you share this information. Um, teaching is one of the best forms of learning because it forces you to both understand it and internalize it yourself but it also allows you to own the material because you're gonna put it in your own words and you're also gonna have now external accountability because when you share it with other people, they <laughs> expect you to follow that as well. And then finally, um, uh, I wanna know like what isn't clear. Um, I've been doing this, this sort of internally with the, within the agencies I've worked with and the places I've consulted at and I'm always trying to make this better and more relevant to people. So um, there's a survey link, uh, tinyurl.com slash Nashville-estimator um, I have business cards up here. Um, if you have any feedback, I would love to talk to you and, uh, again, make this more applicable to everyone in this room so that way you found this a very valuable uh, presentation to attend. So a couple quick shout-outs. Um, my company that's uh, sponsored me being here and really allowed me to do this work even though it's no longer my day-to-day. -day. I'm not, no longer in the agency space. I work more on the product side. But with DDEV, we still have this philosophy of, of Building websites, not only the technical components of it, but the actual workflow, the, the management of the whole process from pre-sale all the way to RFP is a very complex system. And just like we're now trying to do on the tooling side, this presentation is really more on the workflow, team management, client expectations uh, component. So that's done with a pitch. Um, but how did I get here? Um, I'm not a project manager by training. I've never taken a PMP certification. I've never gone to an Agile Scrum certified whatever. Um, I am, even though I'm overly educated in some aspects of my life, I am completely uneducated uh, in terms of formal classes and curriculum in this space. I come from an engineering background where I, I was trained on how to solve problems in a critical way. Um, and then I sort of got thrown into this space um, because I started to find out that it wasn't just the technology, it wasn't just like how to build the, the site, how to hire the best engineers and how to deliver the best solution, but it was how to understand the client, how to have empathy for them, how to put, piece that all together, how to bridge the gap between project managers, developers, stakeholders, business, business analysts, et cetera. Um, so I've had a, a kind of a windy road even to get to Drupal, but then once I got to Drupal, um, I moved more from pure engineering to pure operations and starting to work on everything from HR, training, onboarding, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if what I say seems to come from left field, it's probably because I wasn't, again, trained in the classical sense of project management. Um, but I also have to acknowledge that um, while I may say th things here that may seem like this is my own material or I, or I have some unique spin on it, the reality is we all in this, in this space stand on the shoulders of giants. I mean, open source is all about contributing to and learning from the best of the best. 
And I can't thank the people on this screen enough. Uh, Seth Brown, COO of Lullabot, uh, I met him seven years ago at Drupal Camp Colorado, and his talk about uh, using spreadsheets and getting high-low estimates from all of his uh, developers and so forth was one of those like transformative aha moments. Um, Todd at Four Kitchens, again, consultancy scrum, huge kind of like light bulb moment. And Cindy McCourt, her book, still relevant today. I recommend it to any project manager that's dealing with projects over 30K. It is just a phenomenal resource in the community. Um, and then there's people outside, the, the off the island, everything from the goal by uh, Goldrat and all the way down to Scott Birkin, uh, formerly of Microsoft, and, and David Allen. So if you're a student in this space and you found this talk in any way valuable, I would absolutely recommend finding those authors, finding those people, finding old sessions, videos, et cetera, and study them because they have a lot of really good nuggets of information that I think take this to another level. And finally, this talk is about you. Um, my job here is not to just go over what I've learned along the way. If it doesn't apply to you and if it doesn't make an impact, I have failed you. And I feel like in this space, I, I, there's a story, even this DrupalCon, where um, you know, one of the Lullabot uh, individuals, Chris, a keyboard cowboy, who's been you know, doing podcasts for years, you know, still um, you know, had you know, waited years before he went to Jeffrey McGuire to ask him to join the printout because he felt while he could contribute in, in code and contribute in podcasts, et cetera, but that he just wasn't good enough or couldn't, you know, uh, you know, had to ask for permission to do something else in a different aspect of contribution. And so I want you to take this material, take what's useful, discard what's not for you, mash it up, make it your own, and next year or two, you be presented on this material. You take, stand on the shoulders of giants, everyone before you, make it your own, make it better, and so, even if, you know, you don't need permission to use any of this, but I want you to explicitly call that out because it took me several years to get off the sidelines myself because I thought I'll never compare to Seth. I'll never compare to Todd because they've mastered this. They are the, the, you know, the people that have mastered this process. It's not true. They are very good at what they do, but they want you to absorb this material. And just like we review patches and re-roll them, this is like a, a PR to the community. So why specifically are you here? Why specifically am I here? Because I've, um, you know, it, it's, it's great to join a company that, that's doing well and that already has you know, everything together, all the processes, et cetera, but not all of us have the luxury of being, um, you know, landing a job or, or joining a company that has everything going smoothly, all the processes in place where you just plug in, join it, and just crank away. A lot of us in here, we, we don't want to necessarily admit it, but we've come from, uh, you know, we've had some fights in the trenches. So I've, I've had the, um, the pleasure and the, um, uh, and the experience of um, being hired in a turnaround situation, which is, you know, old company, great uh, employees, you know, big brands, but, you know, definitely have gone through some rough times. And so, you know, we look, we look at problems as things to avoid. But sometimes the, the problem is the way. Sometimes that is the path forward to greatness. It is the potential to, to have to dig deep in yourself and, and as a team, figure things out and invent new processes, et cetera, that are, that are even better than the ones that you are trained on and the ones that other people have been describing. So I've been working on you know, larger projects, smaller projects, um, things where it, was very, it would have been very easy to break process, break protocol and just cowboy mode everything. But a lot of what I um, ended up, I guess, packaging and creating here was a result of those hard times, and they not only helped us get back out of hard times, but they really helped us excel in good times. So that, again, I feel was like a very unique experience that others may have in, in this room, but we don't like to talk about it because no one wants to talk about the failures. No one wants to talk about you know, the, the 5X budget or you know, the thing that was two years late or you know, the fact that someone had to be let go because you know, it's not just budgets that you know, scope creep, it's like that cost the business and that, rent, that caused um, you know, cash flow issues. But it was through those experiences that we really, um, in my opinion, designed something amazing. Um, and so the end goal of this talk is what I'm, I guess for lack of a better word, coining the evolving estimator. And I really like the word evolving and force it to be in that because we are so um, indoctrinated to get to contracts and the estimate, this 
fixed moment in time of a number that happened six to nine months ago that we'll refer back to and talk 20, 30 times. And we need to break that paradigm. We need to understand that, that there's a time component, there's a context component to that estimate. And we need to have that in our minds from day one and set that expectation. And um, again, I, I'm very proud of the websites we've built. I'm proud of the teams I've hired. I'm proud of all those things. But like this work was probably my, the thing I'm most proud of in, in anything I've done in Drupal, even with the PCI compliance paper. And so I'm just really honored to be able to share this with you. And I hope it makes an impact to you as it did for me and the people that I've worked with. So um, I've, I won't read this verbatim, but I've had people go to previous versions of this um, and say that, you know, how it was very you know, transformative to their business, uh, specifically when they lost people in certain key sales or biz dev roles. Um, I've actually used this to have clients sell themselves on upsells and budget increases. Said, I, oh, I see how I'm manipulating things and I see in real time how those are affecting the price and I not want those things, so can you move those into scope? And I realize as I do that, the numbers improve to 20K or 30K more, cool. But I'm empowered to work with you to make that decision as opposed to it being dictated at them from the vendor and agency. And so, I, I mean, it was, it was phenomenal. So those conversations were less um, adversarial and more collaborative. And, um, and also they, they, they evolved because um, when you use a Google spreadsheet with revision history, people can actually go back and self-check their own work where they were in time of like how that estimate changed, which is pretty fun. Um, but really, more importantly, you get to these, these three end goals, which is you, you have to maximize or, or design a process that works for all stakeholders. So it has to work for the team. You know, you know, developers are giving uh, uh, scopes and estimates that are realistic. It has to work for the business. It has to, you know, we can't just um, try to define everything up front, you know, spend 100 hours pre-RFP, uh, getting everything, you know, T's crossed, I's dotted, and then lose the business and, and, and cost the company a, a lot of money and all those chances. And you also have to protect the clients because if, if, if you have even the best developers and the best project managers and you can deliver the result, but you can't do it in a way that actually fits their budget, their timeline, it's still a fail and it still can break the relationship. It still could result in, in, the, in a project failure. So it, this process in my mind and in my experience has been a best fit. It's not perfect, but it's been a best fit trying to make sure that we're doing right by all three of those stakeholders. So how do we get there? I'm, I'm talking about this and um, I don't want you to look at this like a checklist, although you can get very mechanical about this process. Um, I've trained people, you know, junior PMs um, and sales uh, representatives that were not in the website agency space that came from other industries. So um, I did try to, um, for the initial stages, I did try to make it easy enough where you could literally fill out some formulas and some equations and, and get some, some gut shot reactions or gut shot estimates. But I feel like if you don't have the mindset and the concepts behind them, um, you won't be able to really uh, work through every use case. So I want to spend a bit of time going through some concepts and some of the mindset things such that, uh, again, you're empowered to use what's useful to you, discard what isn't. But when things aren't working for your specific agency or your specific clientele, you kind of have a sense of like how you can modify it to still achieve the same objective. So. This is kind of like where we're going. Um, I'm gonna stop uh, at a later slide and actually go through this. Um, I'm not a graphic designer. I wish I could make this look pretty, but <laughs> I'm not. Um, but in a sense, again, this is the journey from RFP to delivery, and we need to figure out what estimation process is, what level of detail, what, how do we break things apart, and how do we re-bring them back together into the development process? So I'm gonna go over, um, uh, the, a couple concepts, like things like lenses, things like the cost of customization, things like progressive enhancement that are going to help understand each of these little funnels, like, you know, how you go vertical, uh, sorry, how do you go horizontally, how you integrate things vertically, and how you kind of get to this map and we can go through it together. So, um, whenever someone says the estimate, I mean, it's like a four letter word to me, it just, it just always goes all over everybody, the client, the, the individual, and you know, we, we, you've definitely been in situations, I, I, I hope 
not too many times, but you know, project's gone two years, three years, whatever, and then people refer to the estimate, back to the contract written in five hours, you know, two years ago by someone that didn't necessarily um, even fully understand all the detail. And so I, I keep going back to we, we, can't, we can't keep saying it as if it was that fixed thing. So in my mind, I define these things like an estimate was, again, I always say an estimate is a guess, is a guess, is a guess, because it's never perfect. We never know all the information. But it's a guess regarding the level of effort of a task based on the current information at the current moment in time, period, end of story. An expectation is a current belief of what will happen in the future based on perceptions of the past. Perceptions. You could be using the same words in a conversation and people will come up with completely different perceptions of what was described. And that is important to keep reminding ourselves because we have had you know, developers, project managers, I was crystal clear, I said X. Well, they didn't hear X. <laughs> and we need to make sure that we have representations of like, that's why we use comps, that's why we use wireframes. We're trying to to look at things from different lenses, which is a concept I'll, I'll go over. And then evolution, again, how the level of effort and perception evolve with time based on new information, new conversations, and context. Um, how many of you are familiar with the concept of user-centered design? A few, a few, okay. You're probably doing something similar, but it's just a more formal way of describing it. So I, I, wanted, I used this a few times in the talk, so I just wanted to make sure it was, it was covered uh, explicitly. But you know, most people have the concept of a discovery period, you know, a design period. Um, some people skip, you know, they sort of merge definition in those two. Um, and then there's that development period and whether you're doing agile, waterfall, et cetera. And then at some point there's a training, a migrating deploy period. So I just wanted to make sure that those concepts were in, um, recognized. Okay. So these six things, um, I feel like are just the critical components to understand how we get here. And I've spend, uh, spent a lot of time, again, working with individuals to provide examples and describe all these things. And I hope, um, again, each one of these will be useful um, and, and clear. And I will, I'll refer back to them when I actually pull up the template and the estimator of like how we use that concept to, um, to modify and, and to, to evolve that. So lenses, I used to use this uh, analogy because um, I, I just loved it of the, the three blind men and the elephant. And it's this, it's this concept of, you know, if each one of them went and put their hand on one part of an elephant, one had the tusk, one had the trunk, you know, one had the tail, and you ask them to describe the whole, right? They would all fail, right? Because their lens into that experience is touching one aspect of something that's very complex. And I've seen designers, developers, you know, we all have a different lens into a project. You know, some people, I'm a huge information architecture buff. I love breaking content types, fields, whatever. I mean, that, that's my jam. That's what I love doing. Um, it makes designers crazy because I'm immediately on a build spec and I'm, I'm just off to the races because that's, that's what I love. And that's when I see a web page, I'm really in my mind saying, okay, that's a view, that's a block, you know, there's the list, yada, yada, yada. Um, so we all look at things from the lens of both our experience, our skill set and just where we spend most of our day. So let's try, to use, let's try to not use a web example. Let's try to use other examples of how do we break things down into those subsystems. And if you even look at like, you know, a human body, it's like you know, we get used to just calling someone a name, like you're Rick, you're a project manager, or you're, you're a developer. And we, we get to these high layer of abstractions where we focus on things like, yes, the outcome, yes, the experience, but we lose all the details, all the underlying systems that, come on animation, there we go, oops, right? So there's many aspects of this. Um, you know, the nervous system, the skeletal system, the digestive, the muscle system, um, and they're not only independent, meaning you could study them individually, but they're interconnected. You know, the respiratory system is what brings oxygen to the bloodstream, and the bloodstream is what transports the fuel to the muscles, and the muscles are what keep the skeleton up. And they're all interrelated. So we can look at things in each system, but then we also have to connect them and make sure that they work together. And the same thing with an RFP. Like we get a website and we get this five to 50 page document and there's just bullets and maybe a screen grab. And it's like, hey, make this, but for my company. And you know, here's the few things I, I want. And 
you know, I, I use more of like the tr traditional like MVC, you know, model view controller, you know, idea to kind of break things. Like, okay, there's the visuals. What, how does this look? You know, there's the data model. Like, what's the actual database, you know, that powers this? Are we, are we using, you know, tables on our, our side? Are we using Apache Store? Are we, are we going to external systems? How are we, we structuring the thing together? And then even then, um, you know, that's not enough. That's, that's like knowing the, 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 the bones and the muscles of a human body, but not knowing how they interact, the, the actual signals coming from the nervous system that are moving you and, and, and doing things. And that's where user stories are the if then, if this, then that. And each of those lenses has many, many um, ways of, of breaking that out. You know, you can break the presentation out to, again, style tiles and mood boards and um, live prototypes in the browser and um, a whole host of things. And they only provide you one lens into the project. You have to look at it just like you would study the human body um, and all the subsystems, you have to look at the website and those individual components. And there's a lot of ways to look at it. <laughs> um, we at one point try to inventory like, you know, for a 500K project, how many different ways can we try to look at this and make sure that we find the detail and that we're looking at how they connect together. And this is just one level of it. You know, not only the, the project manager side of like, okay, what's the just budget? What's the number? What's the phases? What's the timeline? But audit, you know, security audits, you know, comps, style tiles, um, accessibility, you know, compliance, um, HIPAA, uh, PCI, um, and those all have to be broken down and studied individually and then reconnected <laughs> at the end. So, um, you know, the, the, the trite, you know, takeaway of, you know, a point of view is a view from a point and each stakeholder, um, you know, you may be working with a client that's very um, marketing branding heavy. And they don't care about those stupid details of the information architecture, and, or they don't necessarily think through of, of like the actual user stories of how do I how do I start, how do I go through a flow from start to finish. Um, so it's up to us to sort of have all these tools to be able to look at the site from these lenses when appropriate. We don't have to do this for like a 10K project because this is totally overkill. But you find the number of lenses that make sense based on the types of features that that client is bringing to the table. And as I stated before, the really important thing is that at the end of that process, when you break it all into pieces, we have to figure out a way to bring it all back together to integrate it to the actual website we're building. So this is um, the concept of progressive enhancement for us. And, and I haven't found a better word of saying this, and I know this means different things to, you know, in terms of like fallbacks and, and so forth and so on. But to me, um, I love the quote um, by Vesa, the, the features are cheap, details are expensive. I freaking love Simply Test Me. It is fantastic, right? You go click a module, boom, and in like 60 seconds, you are up, you're clicking things around, you see the commerce distribution, it's amazing. Client's like, wow, you showed me that in a minute. So the rest of the site should take three hours, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> that won't that'll take um, 100 hours minimum, up to thousands of hours. I mean, we've had people with, I have, like, oh, that demo you showed me was amazing. Um, I have an IBM DB2 connector to a thing that does real-time pricing based on clients, and I need it to get inventory updated every 30 seconds. And you're like, huh, hmm, yeah, five minutes, no. <laughs> you know, you are, you are way up several orders of magnitude of complexity, right? And this is a problem that we face because humans are not really good about thinking in orders of magnitude. You're like, oh, yeah, 20% more, like, you know, double, is that, is that twice as much? Is that three times? No, it's like 30 times as much. So, um, so that's not to say we can't get accurate. That's not to say that like we can't get within that order of magnitude, but we have to use this concept of like, we see the RFP, we see this high level detail, but now let's, you have to kind of zoom in and you really have to see, is it get more complex or does it get less complex as you zoom in? So um, here's a picture, super fuzzy. Um, an idea what it is? What's fixing more? You're amazing. <laughs> um, when I see something, like, and, and that's, that's the beauty of this process. Once you've already seen one of those things, you're able, you have experience with what a mixing board is, and you're able to discern patterns that others can't see. Because like, when you get to this part, it's, it's getting more clear, and it looks almost like it could, you know, someone who has more of maybe an um, uh, experience with uh, textiles or cloth might say, oh, this is maybe a pegboard. Maybe I'm using this to, like, weave things in, or maybe this is more like a game board where I'm moving things in. And then you get to that last, oh shit. <laughs> There's not only each of these dials, but each of these dials can mean different things. And all of a sudden I went from, 
you know, is this just a textile of like a carpet? <laughs> or is this that much detail behind it? Next one, what's this? Telescope, yeah. So um, this looks like two suns, right? Or two stars, right? Well, it is from the Hubble telescope, <laughs> by the way. Um, then we go a little, little more resolution. Anyone know what it is yet? Little? And it's a uh, nearest uh, moon. So at that point, further enhancement doesn't really get as much more, right? I mean, you know it was Pluto, and you still know it's Pluto, right? So you don't really need to spend more time getting there. And as you get in closer, you don't actually get you know, more detail, it's, you, you still just get the, the general shape of the heart in, in Pluto, et cetera, et cetera. But from a feature, you pretty much have it with some, with some noise. And then this is one I, I, I love and, you know, conspiracy theorist delight, um, you know, the surface on Mars, the face, right? You know, we had, we had an older image, and then as, as we had better resolution, we found out that there really wasn't a face at all. You know, we, we zoomed in and actually found less detail. Sometimes at lower resolutions, we may see things and say, aha, there's going to be this thing, and it's going to have all this structure in it. And, but then when you, when you peel behind the curtain, that's actually not so bad. All right? But in every case, we had to get to some level of detail before we could say, is this going to be a complex feature, or is it going to be an easy feature? The 10 to 100x, or 10,000x cost of customization. Um, I wrote a blog article about this. The, um, I really loved it, the RFP and the GI Joe line item. And I try to do this in a, in a humorous way, which was, you know, we do websites, right? We have no context of, I mean, some of us may, but I don't really have a context of, you know, the old toy industry and, and all the collectors and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, imagine that you just had some random bullet that just said G.I. Joe. And what possibly could that mean, you know, to a, a storefront that may be using it to, you know, as part of a grand opening or whatever. And the idea is that small changes in like, you know, Purchasing a G.I. Joe action figure on Amazon may take you five minutes, but then modifying that by, you know, clothing, branding, making, you know, making it two inches taller, all of a sudden you're like, I need to get a 3D printer out, and I need to um, hire a fashion designer to, you know, paint the, the, the clothes or, or weave it, um, and then, oh, now I want to have it pixel perfect. Okay, now i got to go back to the manufacturing company because i got to get molds exactly for that you know, height with still the same smoothness and still the same... You know, skin tone and everything else. And, oh, now we're going to do an e-commerce site where everyone builds their own G.I. Joe and scales it to the size they want. How the hell do you do that, right? So the idea here is it's, it's to try to show you that one feature could have literally so many orders of magnitude based in, in what order you live on depends on what level of detail makes sense for the business, makes sense for the website. Is this just because you want it or because it's going to drive an ROI? Um, for the site and for the experience of their end users. Um, but, but we sometimes focus on the details, like we feel like we're already at the right horizon. We're like, oh, I, I think what he wants is this, the, sh the small solution or the big solution. And a lot of what discovery is, is just figuring out, are we on the right order of magnitude? And we do this again with e-commerce, right? It's like, customer says, I have products to sell. Great. Um, do you have like hats that you're trying to sell one a month? Or do you have like full-blown, customized, you know, uh, experience, you know, with a back-end warehouse that you're doing real-time inventory management? So the five-minute solution is, yeah, I can copy a PayPal button, drop it on the site, boom, done, five minutes. Feature, check, right? And then, you know, like you have an hour, okay, maybe you have a few products, but you don't really care about branding and you don't really care if they go off-site, okay, you can go Shopify, just turn it on, configure a few things, done, cool. You have an e-commerce, right? Um, and then there's Commerce Kickstart. I love Commerce Kickstart. Um, it shows a lot, but you know, if you need to switch off branding or you need to start theming stuff, I mean, you're already at 10 hours. Maybe you have to pull in a couple of other modules. Maybe you have to tweak a few things. And now you go to that full-blown custom uh, uh, commerce experience. Um, I've never really had a success at a, at a custom Drupal commerce one for less than 100 hours of development time. I mean, it's just that's where my, my experience shows me that's where I'm at. And then if I, have an if I hear the word integration, I'm like, oh, cool, two to 300 hours, Some, somewhere in that ballpark. I'm, I'm already going up the tiers, right? Um, and then you have the omni channel, channel and I want to, you know, I want customers to submit their own products and I want them to customize the colors and they have this graphic art logo. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Some of that might be off the shelf, right? There might be a module for that, quote unquote. But if there isn't a module for that, then you, you get back up with those, those price brackets. So how to blow a budget? <laughs> We've never done this, right? <laughs> um, in my experience, budgets are not blown by being off on one feature 10 or 
or on all the features by 10, you may have a developer that's consistently above or below because they, they either classically overestimate or classically underestimate. And you can learn that and you can bias for that particular developer or that particular team, right? But, you know, being 20% over budget sucks, but it's not lethal, right? You can, you can get around that and the next time you can kind of start biasing or buffering for those types of things. But the reality is like, if you have that one feature that 10 X is and, and you had 10 features, you've now doubled the budget, right? So the goal of early stages on the process of estimation is not to get all the granularity of that detail locked in from pre-contract or just after contract. The goal is to figure out, are we on the right order of magnitude and, and what are the questions I can give to the client to assess what level they're gonna need so that way I know that we're on, you know, we're not gonna have that one at 2X, 3X, 5X is the whole damn thing because that one feature that I missed or that I didn't ask a clarifying question to see where I was at. So um, I had to spend a lot of time with the sales team on smell tests. So API, <laughs> I need, you know, again, if it's out of the box known, you know, the Salesforce integration module that I literally turn on and that is absolutely it, yeah, I could have confidence that's an hour, maybe some configuration, et cetera. But I've had people with documented APIs <laughs> that their developers are changing daily <laughs> and using us as testers. <laughs> And that, um, you know, yeah, I, I, you, know, you, know, you know the drill. Um, integrations, um, again, we now have ambitious Drupal ex or digital experiences and we're, the Drupal sites are now a part of a greater ecosystem, right? So it's not just this website in isolation, it's that website in isolation with mi migrations and connected and then there's a marketing campaign and, and it's all have to, you know, has to export data or has to bring in data from other places. So integrations, um, extensive requirements. If a client is good enough to you to give you a 50 page RFP, they've thought through a lot of things and they're probably even have more detail behind that because th they went through that level of detail. There may be other stuff behind the, um, behind the curtain. Those that tend to put less requirements are either less thoughtful about it, which is a problem that you need to uh, ascertain that information through discovery. But it also generally means more flexibility. It's like, yeah, I'd like that, but you know, they tend to be less rigid about those. But that, those that put very strict requirements, uh, tend to ha those tend to not be as flexible, and they put them there for a reason, in my experience. Uh, products, mobile apps, you know, features with known complexity, um, you know, multilingual, you know, multiple languages, and, and there's, you know, it could be easy out of the box, but there's, there's known, uh, you know, there be dragons. Um, PCI compliance, HIPAA compliance, all those things. When you start getting into uh, standards, um, there tends to be a lot of care and a lot of focus and knowing like, do they just want it because they want it or are they gonna have like a third party audit scan and you're gonna have to be that and you're gonna have to keep that uh, in mind and check the entire process. So I have a, uh, an article on this. Um, if, if you um, reach out to me, I'll, I'll give you the whole smell test article. It's pretty extensive. And also know your biases. Um, you know, customers may overstate their needs. Again, you know, I don't need the PayPal button. I need the full blown experience. Okay, the 10 hats at $10 a month, you know, you're gonna have to sell this for 50 years to recoup that 100 hours custom development. Do you want to do that? No, okay, PayPal. Um, but also developers, I mean, we, um, I love building new stuff, right? It's so fun, um, but it can also be super costly because it's like, oh, this is just this one tweak. No, that one tweak now put you in a different order of magnitude. Now it's a custom integration. Now it's this thing so that, that developer that meant well didn't know where that trip point was and all of a sudden that two hour task is now 20 hours, 30 hours, et cetera. Um, and then vendors just may be overconfident. I mean, one of the things I, I love the, the gentleman that was able to call it the mixing board, right? Because have to, as you go through those experiences of seeing the, the low resolution, the high resolution, you start getting this like, almost like artificial intelligence, you start being able to just sense little things and I can see that pattern and I know below that surface is that thing. And others just can't see it because they haven't, actually gone through that particular use case before, so they just lack um, the visual cues that know where to get to that one feature. And that's where having multiple eyeballs on, on, a, on a project is very valuable. Bring in your designer, bring in your developer, because they're all gonna look at it from different lenses, and they're all gonna have different abilities to kind of see those visual cues and say, ah, that's a big thing underneath there. Let, let's, go, let's go investigate that further. Um, I, I put this just for here for completeness. Uh, hopefully most people are aware of the, just the interplay of features, budget, timeline. I mean, it's, it's fairly, uh, known, um, but it's just, it's just something to keep in mind that as we're going through this budget uh, uh, template at the end, um, how to know that, uh, you know, how, how they're all interconnected and how they affect how we, we modify and, and go through the estimation process. Uh, consultancy Scrum. I loved this 
slide um, that uh, Todd presented. And it's all about, um, we get in this mindset of like, I, I gotta do it the whole, I gotta adopt this, this methodology completely and totally through the whole process. You know? And there's the waterfall approach, which is like, hey, let's not sign a contract till we understand all the detail. And let's not start building till we, we know everything, we cross T's, we dot I's, and, and so forth. And we try to avoid risk by over planning. And that kind of works, right? I mean, you, um, kind of. Um, but then you get in uh, situations like I was where uh, a year and a half into wireframing and 214 signed and approved wireframes later, <laughs> you, start to develop, you start to design and the design changes the wireframes. What do you do? <laughs> you can never avoid all the things that come up when people start seeing things you know, farther down the, the pipe. So you want to find enough resolution, right? And where the agile is like, we'll just, we'll just start building value. Like we'll just start you know, running sprints and we'll, and we'll just get there, right? But the problem is there's choice points on the road that um, you may start painting yourself in the corner on a certain technology choice where, you know, am I doing this multi-site or multi-domain or am I using Apache Store or not? And, and you eventually, um, you sometimes lose your North Star, right? So you're trying to like avoid budget overhead by, by building rapidly but waste could occur when you went down a completely wrong path that you could have seen if you got a, a, a better view up. So, um, and then Kanban, like once you've actually got through the project, now it's like, you know, per request and you pull it through the system and, it, and it's very, but you, uh, you sort of force the work into this very homogenized task-based system, which doesn't work for a new project. So consultancy scrum was amazing uh, to me because it matches the process with a level of risk, like what are you, what lens are you looking to, to, to what level of progressive enhancement are you looking for in order to, to mitigate, mitigate risk um, appropriately? So in, in waterfall uh, or discovery, you're trying to do waterfall because you're trying to find those interconnections and making sure you get the right resolution. But once you have that, then if you're off 10 or 20 percent, or then you, you could pivot like the individual features, but you know the you know the big systems and you know they're, they're sort of their touch points and where you're going on those touch points, but you have some wiggle room in between them. You found the right order of magnitude, but now you know if they want them red or blue, or you want to tweak it around, or it's just a little bit of extra customization there, then you, you have that flexibility, and that's where Agile is perfect because you can get the exact exact acceptance criteria. Now, if they try to then break that, that order of magnitude back, you're like, uh, 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 we did discovery to kind of know that we're not going to go that level. We're going to stay on this level. We'll deliver you a great feature at the hundred hour commerce level, not the full on e commerce e, uh, ERP with back end warehouse like that wasn't there. And if we cross that, then we go back to that 10x or 100x cost. Make sense? Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll touch on it a little bit more on that, that final graph. So again, bring it all together. So lenses, you know, websites are complex, period. <laughs> they are just difficult things. We need to look at them from every angle, from every vantage point, so we can evaluate um, individually and then how they're going to play together. We don't, we don't want to just look at the design only. We don't want to look just at the information architecture. We don't want to just look at you know, all these uh, just user stories. We need to basically say, how do they all connect, right? And we need to use progressive enhancement. We need to look through each lens to, to the point where we feel comfortable that there's not going to be scary levels of detail that crosses into these massive thresholds and massive spikes, which is the cost of custom. Drupal provides so much out of the box. Use more Drupal core. Use more contrib. And with default settings or with configuration, but the second you get into custom code or um, other things, now you need more experienced developers. Now you have code that you have to maintain, um, that you own. Um, we have constraints. You know, features, timeline, and budgets are interdependent. You can't move one without the other or others. And consultancy scrum, a process that fits risk with expectation. So how do we solve this puzzle? I mean, it's not, and, and I, I feel like I have a, one solution or a solution to this this problem and it may work for a, a lot of you um, but I want to at least walk you through the process so the estimator for me was I mean really at, at, when, when you boil it down it's a google sheet with revision history used to create an evolved detail level of effort and dollars from project inception to launch that's what it is it's it's um, you could do this you probably do it um, in a way, um, or, or you have a, a, a sort of an ad hoc or informal way of doing this. Um, back to sort of the, the first few slides when I, when I mentioned, um, you know, being in a, in, a, in a company where, you know, time was money and, and, and we were, you know, backs were against the wall and, and, and we had a lot of challenges. Um, being able to rapidly assess RFPs, sometimes in the order of 30 minutes, <laughs> and just come up with gut shots of is this even like on the right order of magnitude and then you know, a couple hours pre-sale, again, right order of magnitude. Um, so 
rather than having nothing, I had to create something that allowed me to, to work all the way from that gut shot through something I could literally evolve a single document through the entire process and get to the end where I could use it for a post-mortem with like actual recorded uh, features and um, time spent versus prediction and, and so forth and so on. So again, we have the RFP on the left, right? And mostly gonna be bullet points with you know description of features, description of interaction, maybe a couple screenshots, right? And at the top, we have, okay, sort of what level of um, estimate do we want? And at the bottom, we have the sort of the user-centered de design stages, meaning like, you know, discovery, um, design, uh, definition. Definition, again, meaning more like uh, user stories, requirements, um, you know, detailed build spec, et cetera. And then each of those sort of channels, you know, we're, we're breaking things up into like the visuals, the presentation at the very top. We're breaking it down to like, you know, data models and information architecture in the middle. And that business logic, you know, what are the features categories? Okay, cool. What are the assumptions behind this? What are the questions behind this? Okay, cool. Next level, what are the acceptance criteria? And we're trying to move those along in parallel because there, there are different lenses of it, but there are also different levels of detail that we're trying to assess at, that, at, the, at each stage of the process. And again, we don't want to spend so much time that we, we end up burning 50, 60% of the budget just planning. So we have to have an acceptable amount of risk at each step that we're, we say we got an 80 to 90% one. We feel confident enough that when we go there, there's not going to be a landmine at the next step. All right, so um, so at the very top, you know, you know, when you get an RFP, and like that, when you're in discovery, it's like I started to assess things in, in, in level of features, meaning I don't need to get to full blown acceptance criteria, but I need to know have I properly identified everything? Do, you know, is it 15 features? Is it 30? You know, can I can I go into the client and say I think I heard these 15 things? Am I missing something? Or is that still you know important? You know, is it really 10? Um, you know, and again, site map. Like, have we caught all the old pages that you had? Have we caught all the old pages that you? You anticipate having, um, you know, wireframes. You know, here's what we think the different sites or pages are going to look like, and the sort of boxes that are going to be there, and the certain features that might be in those pages. Again, are we catching everything? Are we missing something? Um, and then at e again, at each step, you just refine it along the way. Again, knowing that you're going to converge it at the end, back to done. So, again, I want you to have this sort of in mind as we're going through the template uh, itself. So. Um, I'm going to go through, the, I, I, again, I said I was going to, uh, not to do this mechanically, but I am going to go through the mechanics. So um, this would be a typical 30K to 300K budget. You know, I mean, it, so if you're at like, you know, a million dollar account, you may have to spend a lot more time at the pre-sales process. If you're, you know, below 30, you know, a lot of this could be overkill, but, you know, it does have a, a wide, wide delta. Um, but when I have the estimator template up and I had an RFP and said, okay, you have two hours. Tell me if this is worth going out to or not. You know, so I, I had a set, set of questions at the top, and my, my objective was just, do I have the feature label correct? Do I have a one to sentence, two sentence description? And I start putting my questions. They say e-commerce. Do they mean, you know, just the, what, you know, what kind of products might they have? Do they have a lot of variation product warehouse? So da 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 some questions to, to ask for discovery. Um, estimate resolution, you know, our, our WAGs, our wild ass guesses. And because we know things vary by orders of magnitude, we don't just say, well, it can be four to six hours. No, it can be four to 40 hours. Because if, we, if they cross that threshold again, so we need to be very, um, be very uh, accurate and not just try to make the client happy by seeing a smaller delta, but saying, we don't know. This one feature could blow up. Let's work through it together. And when I ask these questions, I'm gonna know if it's really up close to the 40 or if it comes back closer to the four. And again, get a sense of budget ranges. Like, if you're a company that their sweet spot is 50 to 100K, you want to know, like, oh, no, this, is, this feels like a 500K project based on there's 50 features and the deltas are off the chart. This is not for us. And you can, you can walk away from it. Um, or if it's too low. Um, so, this, so the goal really is, just, is it even possible in the sort of sweet spot that you're looking for to, to deliver a site of this value? And if you want to be in advance, if you want to get ahead of the game, if you want to sort of like, um, you know, if, if time or budget within the company is allowed, yeah, you can start splitting out the features into phases and everything else, which I'll, I'll show you. Okay, I'm going to start putting on the gas because I want to get the template in the next five minutes. Okay. So in discovery, you update features, you, you, you get the description a little bit tighter, you, you address initial assumptions, you may even draft out initial acceptance criteria, great. This is the key, this red, yellow, green, which I'll show you in the estimator, which is you want to to highlight in the estimate what is mandatory, what is going to provide high ROI, and what can you guarantee, quote unquote, within about 80% of the budget. Like if a client has a $100,000 budget, you're like, I know based on what we just discussed that th this 80%, about 80K worth of things, 
you know, even if things go wrong, but based on those 10 to 20% deltas within the order of magnitude, I'm very confident we're going to get those to you. And then you put things in yellow, which is like, oh, these are high value items. We really want to get to them. And if we just crush it and everything goes smooth and there's no scope creep and there's no problems, we'll get those in as well. So let's work together to make sure we get as much of those yellows in there, right? And then red, here are things you asked us for. We think they're massively intense. They probably don't provide you business value. Um, we documented it, we heard you, but unless there's a significant increase in budget, these things uh, are red flags for us and we potentially won't even take on the project because we know that it's gonna push us way, way above the budget. And then you work with the client to collaborate on this. Literally meet with the client side by side. Let's walk through. Did we miscategorize something in green when it should be yellow? You know, it's not as important to you. So that way you get something else in yellow into green. And I'll walk you through that. Uh, design, you know, you're really just kind of confirming previous um, assumptions. So if new features are surfaced when you start actually, you know, getting the wires and, and comps, you know, you, you'll pull those into new line items. Um, you'll, again, you'll meet with the client at the end of the design phase. Say, okay, how do we do? Do we need to move things around, recategorize things? Um, finally, uh, you know, definition phase, you know, we do a deep dive. I mean, you know, all the developers, technical project architects, solutions architect, we're, we're going through fine tooth comb. We're making sure, again, that there's no, um, there's no uh, landmines. And again, we, we lock in actual time and we start looking at, uh, you know, new features, differentiating them, reviewing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now you go into development, you go in agile, uh, you start building, go on your sprints. Um, and you can still, if new features keep coming up, Keep popping them in the, <laughs> the estimator, color code them differently so you can differentiate them. Um, so you can show how new things were added and they changed and you can recategorize um, if you look like you're gonna run out of budget. And then finally get to your, your postmortem. So um, let's take a moment and just kind of look. Um, again, I am not a designer <laughs> and I know this is probably uh, not zoomed in enough. But um, by the way, uh, after this uh, talk, I will, um, if I have business cards, uh, reach out to me. I uh, have an article which is gonna go into depth about how to work through this mechanically, as well as the actual template itself. It'll be open source, people will be able to download. You can go through the equations. So um, don't feel like you have to catch everything right here. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to, um, to review it. But back to that whole, um, you know, again, RFP lands in your desk. Answer questions, you know, like what's your hourly rate of your company? How many discovery meetings do you have? Like if, you know, how many categories of things are being discussed? Um, is it super complex? Do you feel like you're gonna have to bring multiple people in discovery or is, is one, one developer able to do the assessment or one business analyst or one solutions architect? You know, how many hours do you think your, your, your meetings are gonna be? Uh, do you already get a sense of super complexity? Um, do you get, is this gonna be a very design heavy, branding heavy one? And those equations just drive different high low features, right? So we have different categories, like here's what I think my discovery, my kickoff meetings and, and so forth are gonna be. Uh, I wanna get some initial scoping, uh, design the wireframes based on the number of, of screens and, and so forth. Again, wild ass guesses, just getting numbers on the page. And those are things that are gonna cost money and we absolutely have to do them so they're in green. Okay, I start seeing things like Salesforce integration, e-commerce, cool. E-commerce is the whole point of this project. It was an e-commerce website, cool. So is this a 10 hour e-commerce or 100? I don't know, put it in the line item, but it's definitely green because it's definitely mandatory because it's the whole project. So I green light it, I put a, a one. I see some other things in there, recurring billing. Uh, I don't know if they really need it, um, but I'm gonna put it in there again. Am I just turning on the recurring billing framework? Am I just, you know, or am I doing some more customization? Do I, am I just gonna offload it to Stripe, whatever? And again, my goal is just cap capture, 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 capture. Um, this thing is pretty sophisticated in the sense that I have this one, two, three uh, uh, item. So um, in real time, you can get the high lows <laughs> being calculated. The averages are being uh, uh, updated. So like, as I'm saying, oh, you know, I'm working with my, my PM or working with my, my sales rep and I'm saying, well, I actually, that rating system is actually really important. So I should put it as a one. It's all calculated in real time. So I can see like I'm adjusting, I can move the colors around. And the goal for me is like just rapidly changing this to see you know, how can I get to that 50K budget that they're talking about? I can, up, and then if I cross that budget, the worst case, so I'm looking at the, the high. So the high for the green, so everything I'm, I'm just saying is, is in phase guaranteed is already 17K over budget. Okay, I gotta start slicing more. I gotta start figuring out a way to, to reduce risk. And so those are the questions that I'm gonna start putting into this column over here. So that way when I start meeting the client, I'm like, okay, I think you mean this. So are we closer to two or 20 hours? So you have to ask the right questions that get to that order of magnitude. And 
once you get through the first phase, once you get through discovery, those things no longer become equations. They become the real numbers. They become what was actually spent on that, that project. So then this number up here, the target budget, as well as the current budget, are updated in real time per phase. And then once you get the, the descriptions and the acceptance criteria written out, you can then start recording your actual time spent over here. So if you use Jira or whatever time logging thing you're using, you can just have links to those reports, update the reports, and then you're going to actually see what you're, you're working on, um, how, how good or, or bad you're on, on, on or off course, and then you're going to get updated numbers. At, and at each sprint, you could literally go back to the client and say, look, all those things in green are actually on course or even better. Let's maybe change some things from yellow to green. Let's, let's work with you to get more of those in there. You know, thank you for working with us and not scope creeping some things and, and sticking to this. So now we're able to get more for you. Or oh, these things are adding new features or adding more uh, material. And now we need to take things in green, put them as number twos, get them out of the, the project, and move forward. And then um, sometimes you'll find things like, let me get over here. Um, like back-end fulfillment. <laughs> I mean, again, are we integrating with something? Or do we have to have some back-end ERP? Am I just turning on modules like, you know, just to have stock inventory and, um, you know, order management or order fulfillment, shipping, et cetera? Or do I have to, you know, integrate with Magento or have to integrate with something else? And again, that's where those questions come into play. And if you later found out, like, again, back to, um, as you zoom in, you find that the client even didn't want it to, be, to begin with, you can actually change it as a number four gray it out, and then it, it removes itself from all the calculations. But here's, here's something that's very interesting to me, which is you can see that if I really focus on what delivers value to the client, high value, mandatory parts of the process, and things that I, I know have tight deltas and you know, aren't, aren't hitting, spiking over to one, two, 300 hours, I could deliver this project for 57. But this, those three features that were in red that have those very high gamuts could easily double the budget right there. And so you're trying to work with the client to say, I don't want to see that happen to you. I know that 50K that you have is, is your all-in budget. So we, we just literally can't go down that path without us, taking on, us both taking on an immense amount of risk. And if we take on that one feature in red, we're going to push out all those other features in green. You're literally going to have that one custom feature, and it's going to absorb everything else. So again, it's a lot of working with the client, not against them. In an adversarial way. Do you actually show them that? Yes. I work with them because, um, again, it's, it's websites for a lot of people are like voodoo. They're like, why did, that, why did that commerce kickstart thing take one minute? And why are you telling me like a slight variation of my own theme is 100 hours? Like, what? <laughs> like, they just can't see that. But if you say, like, look, and here's another uh, trick I've used, which is if there's, one, if there's one level that's 100 hours and one that's 10 hours, I will actually put it as two line items. And I'll green light the one, I was like, this is what I want to deliver you, because I know I can get it within your budget for 10 hours, but that, that sort of next level one is 100 hours, and, I, and I'll red line it and make it 100. And I said, if you really want it, we could do that, but you see, like, I can deliver that feature for 10. You're asking me for 100, but we're, 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 in, a, we're in this, uh, we just can't make this work, we're too far apart. And clients don't like that, yeah. <laughs> but they appreciate and respect that. Because they know that you're not just trying to, uh, you know, trying to burn them, or you're not just trying to pad your budget. You're saying, I absolutely, and every feature can be done in like a high beating blow. Back to the whole PayPal button through full blown e-commerce, whatever. So, so um, here are some cool um, rules of thumb I've learned. Uh, I don't know why, but 50 discovery, 15 percent is like the magic number. Um, if you go, if you're going too high, like 25 percent planning, you're too far in waterfall. And you're not gonna, you've already sort of de-risked the project as much as you possibly can. In my, in my experience, in my opinion, super big enterprise projects, you know, one, two, three million, uh, maybe different, but in that sweet spot I was talking about, this, this tends to, to work. Um, the project management is typically 20% of the budget. Like, it just happens. And here's what happens to a lot of projects, uh, especially sales. Oh, there's 100 hours of development. Okay, cool. We have 120 or you know, 100 hours of, of budget. Perfect. <laughs> but they're not accounting for all those overheads. In fact, when you really get down to it, when you slice out all the sort of the, the de-risk in the beginning and the project and QA on the end and the training and the deployment at the end, the actual time spent developing first is about 40% of the budget. And that's a good number to keep in mind when you are assessing something because we, t we get so focused on how much time do I have to develop 
And, you know, again, I have 100 hours of budget. Cool. And we try to pack in 100 hours of development <laughs> into that thing, not accounting for those other buffers. So having a formula like this actually is good for accountability within the team because it's, it's, it's having a realistic assessment of how much project management time, QA, code reviews, and all that's going to take. Um, and if you consciously slice it out, you actually have to then consciously remove it and say, I'm going to move the PM time down to 5%. I'm going to put it on the developer. Well, then they're going to have less time developing, uh, or they're going to spend more time essentially pseudo PMing. Um, so it was actually good for more internal stakeholders, especially sales and biz dev, to have those parameterized as like, no, this is what's necessary to do this. And, and, the, and the, the numbers are, uh, the equations have numbers in them, so you can modify them as, as needed. Um, I did have a scale factor for that. That's why I said, like, in one of the equations you'll see is like, you know, is this heavy branding or light branding? Yeah. Um, that that typically falls in, uh, again, your mileage may vary, ten to fifteen percent. I mean, it depends. Um, yeah. So, but but these ones I feel are universal. Like they just they are just numbers that, if, if I see the discovery too low, I'm like, shoot, we're not spending enough time to like go through and, and look at things through the lenses. And this is comfortable because then developers who are like, I need to have realistic you know, development uh, things and sales and, and everyone else, sort of this, this number is kind of like where, where the best balance of those stakeholders lives. Um, good question. Middle third of the budget, meaning post-discovery, pre-deployment. So those of the five stages, the, the um, uh, design, definition, and development. Um, so again, uh, <laughs> This talk is my pull request, <laughs> Mark's Needs Review by Community. Um, I have worked with several people on this. I feel like it's legitimate. It's, it's, it works more for just one or two companies. Um, and I feel like it does provide different ways of attacking the problem that others haven't attacked it in this exact way. But I, I'm not even in the agency space. I mean, I, I've moved on to, to TRUD. I, I work on DDEV. I'm more on the product side. But this talk was like my thesis. Like I really spent so many years in the trenches and I believe in this material so much that I wanted to make sure that I had one last shot to like get it out in the community. And I'm not there to take this further at this point, but I wanna make sure it's done right and I wanna make sure it's, it's actually validated. So I would love uh, feedback. I, I've had several people ask me if I could turn this into more of a deeper training course, like mechanically walk through a couple ones, uh, a couple RFPs and, and really uh, actually work through you know, filling out the, the template and so forth. Um, I've run trainings internally for project managers to, to adopt this. Um, so I would love your feedback. I have cards um, up front. I have uh, a tiny URL, um, one tiny URL.com slash Nashville dash estimator. Um, I plan on filling, finishing out the article uh, with the template. And um, if you sign up in any one of those uh, formats or, or get in touch with me, I will absolutely make sure you get a copy of those. And uh, I just love this stuff. I love coaching, mentoring, teaching, all this stuff. So um, I'm more than happy to, in my limited but, but, but time, uh, to, to sit down with people because, I mean, this stuff really brings me joy because I've been the developer. I've been the project manager. I've been the account rep. I've been on all sides of this. I've, and when it's not done right, it hurts. It hurts a lot. It hurts the team. They're burned out. You get these death marches. It hurts the client. You now all of a sudden are fighting instead of building. It hurts the business because, you know, you may lose enough money where you have to let someone go, and that affects someone's life. I mean, so this is a really important topic, and having experienced the pain of not doing it right, and having experienced the joy of when it feels like it's in such a good flow, um, I just love this 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 topic. And so, I, I even though it's not my day to day anymore, I'm more than happy to have conversations on this, and I would love any and all feedback to make this better, make it more accessible, make it more understandable. Um, so, thank you all for investing your time to be with me. I hope that I gave you something actionable, something shareable, and have sort of opened your mind to maybe a different way of looking at this in a way that you find valuable for you and your company. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what you think your budget is, and yet it, it sucks that you wish they would just tell you what it was, 
but that's where you just have to take a shot in the dark and, and just go for it. Um, you know, 